Hi, so um, I'm Tom Talpy uh, with Microsoft. Uh, back to another Persistent Memory Summit. I've done these for a bunch of years. Uh, today I'm talking about just Windows support. And you may have noticed that the day is sort of building. In, uh, it's sort of going up the stack a little bit. We started the morning with a talk of middleware and enabling technologies, the file system on top of that. And my colleague Neil Christensen talked about some of the guts of the Windows support. I'm basically going to bring it up further, and we, we got through the fabric, so I'm going to mention those too, by the way. That's my, my thing. But I'm going to bring it up further and just give a, a picture of Windows support at the service level, if you will, and those Windows components that use it. And just try to show you how ubiquitous persistent memory is in Windows today. We've been shipping it for some time. Um, so in Windows and Windows Server, I'm going to list basically six topics, and I'm just going to run through them. Uh, they'll end with a little bit of a speculative uh, uh, look at the future. Uh, and I have 20 minutes, so we're going to be moving right along. So um, first, um, Windows Persistent Memory indu Industry Standards Support. Um, I think it's important to stress that Windows is, is, runs on uh, industry standard hardware, right? And so we strive to support industry standards, both with local and with protocol standards. Um, so Windows, since uh, we first shipped the PM support back in uh, 2016, supports JETIC standard uh, NVDIM ends, all right? And so it's these JETIC specs, byte addressable energy backed interface, that's pretty much the, the formal definition of an NVDIM N. Uh, it also supports UFI 2.5 and 2.7 for the label format, for the block translation table. This is the format on disk, if you will, on DIM. For the, uh, for the data that's stored in the non-volatile device. And finally, ACPI 6.0 through 6.2, the NFIT, which was mentioned early on, that's the ACPI's enumeration of this device and how it expresses the device to the OS. We read that NFIT out of the ACPI discovery. Um, the uh, NVDM, NVDM root and NVDM objects are all in the, in the ACPI namespace, address scrub, all these things are are features at the ACPI level that we, uh, that we import, if you will, and use to uh, provide NVDIM and PM support to applications. Another really important thing that we support is uh, APIs. And uh, we, I just want to mention the Windows PMDK that Andy uh, mentioned. This is Andy's, uh, Andy's baby, uh, formerly known as NVML. Um, and hosted at, uh, at pmem.io. The source and pre-built binaries for Windows and Linux are available online. You can go use them today. Just follow that link and go to the uh, pre-built binaries and find the Windows uh, pre-built stuff. Or, you know, like Andy said, check it out, party on. You know, check out the code, uh, party on. You can do all kinds of things with these libraries. There's a lot. They are. Uh, optimized for efficient use of PM hardware on Windows. Okay, so they call native Windows APIs in this Windows uh, specific version of them. Um, they, they use Windows DAX to map the files. They use the, the uh, Windows uh, RTL runtime, the run RTL uh, real-time uh, library, runtime library, um, uh, which uh, Neil mentioned earlier. It's calling these native interfaces, so it's highly efficient. They work, interestingly, in both PM and non-PM hardware environments. So you can play with them even if you don't have a PM device in your, in your, uh, in your machine. And the use case is simplified cross-platform application development. We're doing this because the, the PMDK is today's best example of portable, persistent memory aware APIs, right? And we want them to run everywhere. So they're running on Windows just the same way they run on Linux. There they are. All right, let's move up the stack a little bit into some of the Windows components that use persistent memory. Um, Hyper-V, the Windows uh, virtualization uh, uh, solution, if you will. Um, it's a component of Windows. It's shipped with base Windows. It's been shipped for a long, long time. Uh, Hyper-V began to support persistent memory back in the fall 2017 release, okay? Um, uh, so uh, persistent memory was supported back in 2016, but Hyper-V began to expose it uh, in 2017. These things all sort of build on each other, right? And they roll out over time. 
So Windows and Linux guests can create a Gen 2 VM. If it's a Gen 2 VM, then it supports this new device called a VPMEM device, a virtual persistent memory device. There's a new VHD file type that's basically the image of this new device uh, called a VHD PMEM. I'm told actually that the VHD PMEM is pretty much exactly the same as the VHD file. It's just kind of renamed. There are definitely some tweaks in there. It has to be a DAX file system underneath it for Windows to expose it as PMEM, for instance. But the, the raw format of it is really pretty generic. So it's more about the management of this device, of this file and this PMEM device. The admin decides when he creates it, if it has a BTT, the block translation table is important to some applications because it provides sector atomicity. Um, VHD PMMs can also be mounted as a plain old SCSI device, right? So you can mount them just like you could an ordinary VHD file and read it and write it like it was a device virtually. So, you know, they, they basically are the same, uh, the same flexibility as the, as the uh, Windows uh, v native VHD. And then each VPMEM device is backed by exactly one VHD PMEM file. So there's the one-to-one -one relationship between these things. Um, a few details of the, of the virtual PMEM behavior. So the fall 2017 release back last year enabled the basic persistent memory exposure into a uh, Hyper-V PM. But a new insider preview, which you'll notice the, uh, the time, let's see if this laser pointer works, um, uh, 2018-116, right? Last week, we, we, we released a new uh, Windows Server Insider Preview 17074. We call this RS4, that's uh, sort of the current release cycle of window, that's a nickname that you might see here and there on the, on the net. But um, uh, read this uh, blog and it will have some details about these Hyper-V support. Um, and where to get the, 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 uh, the ISO file to uh, boot it. So DAX, it supports DAX and BTT. This is a little bit generic and there's a couple things that are only visible in the preview. Um, DAX and BTT programming models. Um, including Win32 APIs and PMDK, all supported from the guest. All right, so it's basically the full exposure of Windows PM support from the guest. Um, it uses large pages automatically. Neil referred to that earlier uh, when available. Uh, Hyper-V does. Um, there's some feature capacity limits. The initial release was 256 gigs maximum PMM size. We we're, we're raising that to one terabyte in the preview. Um, there's a minimum, well, maybe that's not so important. Maximum number of devices, 128. I think that's pretty good for now. Um, uh, new features in preview. This one is really interesting to me. Migration, actually live migration of VMs with PMEM allocations, right? So if I'm migrating from one machine with persistent memory and the guest uh, using it to another machine with persistent memory, I can move the persistent memory along with it, right? We do storage migration, but VPMEM is a little different from a storage migration. This is a new feature that's now fully supported. And it's pretty cool. It works. Um, uh, this would use, by the way, Hyper-V Live Migration, which is TCP or RDMA aware. And it's quite efficient when it runs over RDMA, trust me. Uh, all management of this stuff is implemented through PowerShell. But I just want to mention that some meta operations are not yet supported. Thin provisioning, things like that on VP MEMS is not, is not supported. So checkpoints, backup, save, restore, those are all things that, uh, that are not available yet. Over time, we'll see. And this is a component level view, which is, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I just want to show that basically the, the, the host process, this big box on the left, is basically setting up an environment for the guest process. And this just shows a little bit of the mapping where you can see that operations from a host worker process basically open a VHD PMEM file that lives on an NVDIM, that lives in a physical address space, and maps it into a region on the guest that's described by an ACPI NFIT that the guest receives when he boots. So, you know, there's a bunch of this you know, physical hardware instantiation of it that's virtualized for the guest, but in particular, the ACPI NFIT, the VHD PMEM file, <laughs> not my laptop, <laughs> um, 
Anyway, uh, so this is all virtualized. And this little green, uh, green box here is the virtual PMEM device to a PMEM region that's a subset of a persistent region that is mapped by the host. So that's basically some of the guts. Just to ground it for you, this is the configuration example, and it's literally four PowerShell commandlets. And you can see they got you know, little PowerShell prompts. We're going to create a VHD. It's going to be a four gig PMEM device. Then we're going to create a Gen 2 VM that's going to receive it. All right. This is actually a very generic command that just creates a new uh, VM. We're going to add a VM PMEM controller to that device. And then we're going to attach the VPMEM device to that controller. And poof, the VM just got a virtual PMEM device. There you go. Some of these commands, like Neil said, um, may be subject to change the arguments and the names of the commands and things like that. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, all this stuff is in the 17074 preview. And some of them are generic and in all versions. All right, I mentioned this last year. I'm just going to say it again because it's important to remember. Uh, there's another important Microsoft product called SQL Server 2016. Uh, SQL Server 2016 uses persistent memory. It started consuming it about the very end of 2016, about a little over one year ago, a year and a month ago. Um, and um, uh, it, the, the problem for SQL Server and for most transactional databases are that their, their performance is gated by the log write speed, right? The log write is the critical transaction object, and it's latency sensitive. The slower the log write is, is made safe, the, slower, the longer the database will take to commit the transaction. So the faster the log, the more database updates are possible. So, you know, databases love low latency storage. They love it, love it, love it. Um, it turned out to SQL that it wasn't necessary to put the entire log in persistent memory. Home. They just needed to accelerate the log commits. They just needed to make them safe quickly, right? They didn't care that they had appended them to some physical file that was the log. They just needed to put them in a journal, if you will, and get them safe. Um, and their approach was the log on VM. It's called tail of log. And these two little red lines are the performance critical part of these red circles, are the performance critical part, where it does the write to a region and waits for the receive. Once that happens, it can lazily build the entire log and flush it out to, uh, to backing store. And so SQL Server began to use this uh, about a year ago. Uh, it uses this byte addressable log tail uh, approach. It actually doesn't need much memory. It only needs, I don't know, 20 megabytes, 50 megabytes, very small amounts to accelerate this in general. Um, but it's enab fully enabled through a DAX volume on uh, persistent memory in Windows. And we get about a 2x speed up. HK means hecaton. That's the in-memory version of SQL Server. But you can see it's almost exactly 2x, and the latency is almost exactly half, which is uh, the latency of the transaction. Right? Time per transaction. All right. There's another piece. It's called Storage Spaces Direct. Storage Spaces Direct is our uh, software-defined storage solution for Windows. It's a, it's a basically, it uses, um, it's a set of servers that, that act together in a, usually a clustered environment to expose a unified view of their own internal services. And one of the most important services of that is storage. That's why we, you know, storage spaces direct in particular is targeted at that. And there's a number of different scenarios that it's deployed in. Scale out file server, where it's basically a number of, uh, of file shares that are just accessed by local hosts. A SQL server, it's a great platform for running a, a highly available uh, SQL server. And hyperconverged compute and storage. That's what's shown here in this picture. Here we actually have the VMs running on these three blades that are physically part of the entire thing. And the three blades work together to provide a unified storage pool. And the purpose of that pool is that it's highly available and scalable, but in particular, the pool can accept different devices. And one of the devices that we support are persistent memory devices, these block devices today that uh, the Windows has talked about for the last year. 
It uses an Ethernet RDMA storage fabric, and it is shipped in Windows 20 Server 2016 data center. But there's an update previewing in that same 17074 build that will have a couple of the things that I'm going to mention right here. So it's a storage space is direct. The, these pick those boxes down at the bottom. It can live on hard disks. It can live on solid state disks. It can live on NVMe devices, and presto, it can run on persistent memory <coughs> devices. Okay, so all four of these types of devices are supported by Storage Spaces Direct as part of those low-level pools. And they can be deployed for various reasons. One way to pool them is for literally capacity devices. If these are the large DIMMs, you know, these terabyte size DIMMs and up, you can actually pool them as a capacity device, raw, native, just like that. You can also mix them with, for instance, an NVMe device for capacity, right? So there's a pool of the hot data goes in PM. This is called SCM, by the way. That's a somewhat uh, antique term, but these pictures, I couldn't get it out of the pictures. Um, it should say PM like it did on the intro slide. You can pool them with NVMe, and so the hot data goes to the, to the low latency tier and the slightly warmer data goes to the NVMe tier. Or you can go all the way down to SSD for capacity. At the same time, you can tier them as caching devices. And this is where it really gets interesting, right? You can put SCM in front of the NVMe, right? And, and move things down to it. Or you can also put SCM uh, PM in front of uh, SSDs. So here you're using one technology for cache and another technology for capacity. So it's super flexible. And these are just a few ideas, right? It's not showing the HDD, obviously. So Storage Spaces Direct Persistent Memory Support is initially block emulation, where PM is cache capacity, like I just showed. But I just want to make a little hint. I'm not making a product announcement. I'm just talking about that's something that's happening. But uh, we've, we've envisioned further PM usage. And let me give you a taste for what that might look like. Um, Windows RDMA to persistent memory support. OK, so this is my baby. This is what I usually talk about when I come here or when I come to the Storage Developers Conference. Because my, my bag for the last couple of decades, I, I, I hesitate to say it's almost a couple of decades, has been RDMA and storage, applying RDMA to storage fabrics such as ZFS, such as SMB. Um, but persistent memory brings a whole new wave of interest in this because of the latency, the low latency, right? The RDMA semantics are not quite the same as the uh, storage semantics required by PM, as Rob introduced. We need some extensions. The industry is converging on RDMA flush. I'm proud to say that I proposed it two or three years ago, maybe four, I don't know, a bunch of years ago. And it's moving along rather well, but it takes time, it takes time to do these kinds of things. I will say that, Rob, there needs some more stuff. Right after flush is one, what we call non-posted write. Another one is integrity, right? If we bypass the CPU and it gets dropped in memory, we're trusting that hardware to have dropped it in memory. How do we know it was good? Trust me, the cloud doesn't work that way. Enterprise storage <coughs> doesn't work that way. We verify all transactions, right? So what do we do? We call the CPU? Well, that's what we were trying not to do, right? That was the big bubble in the pipeline in, in, uh, in Rob's and, and uh, Stephen's pictures. So that's there. And also security. How do we protect the data? Security actually can provide integrity. So there's some interesting uh, uh, cross-reference here. I talked about this at Storage Developer Conference back in September. Please do. Also, applying it to Windows and Windows SMB3, I talked about that too. Enough said. Give us four more years. OK, four years. Uh, Rob already <laughs> talked about this one. So this is great. I don't have to talk about this one. But I just, uh, I just want to say that you know, here's the flush, which is great. Right? But what about the transaction? And the important thing is this dotted line right here. Right? We hold the right after flush before we perform the right. Right? We stop it right there. That's what's important. That stops it. How do we use this? SMB3 is my baby. So I talked about this at least two years ago. Um, and there are three ways here. The implementation for SMB3 adopting PM and PM flush happens in three phases. There are three different uh, storage paths here. 
this skinny little line is I.O. requests. Traditional I.O. We use the DAX file system in the PMEM just like we would a file system. <coughs> the more interesting one is when we do loads and stores to a mapped buffer. This is where we're accessing a DAX file directly from the server. And this is basically mem copies from the network packet to the buffer cache, quote unquote, which is actually the file directly. More efficient, but not everything. What you really want is for the RDMA NIC to push data into that file directly. To do that, we need that commit extension. Otherwise, we have to go back to the server to cause the flush to happen. And so there are some stages that we're going through. And we showed in the SMB server both modes one and mode two in our SDC, what's new in SMB three presentation. In the future, we are working on full mode three. Now, I will tell you that storage space is direct, is layered on SMB three as a transport, so you can connect the dot. Summary, persistent memory is well supported by Windows. It's been there for about two years, now a year and a half. We've been working on it for at least two years. It's also well supported by the Windows services above it. So there are lots of good reasons to plug an NVDM <coughs> into Windows. Watch for further adoption and integration. I don't know if I have a minute for questions. Minute. Jenny's not giving me the hook. You No, we're streaming it, so we really need to speak to the mic. So would you go back to the previous slide where it shows one options one, two, and three? So two uh, says mem copy, which involves CPU. It does. Um, okay. The so SMB3 server runs in CPU context. This is code. Yeah. This is hardware. Okay, so it's not just pure hardware wire to wire. It's, there it will is be pure hardware copy. wire to wire when we get to phase three. Oh, thank yeah. you. You set up the I.O. using software to register this memory and return a pointer, the, a handle to the client, and then the client does everything through the NIC. That's the goal. Just that the bytes move through the CPU for two, mem copy. Uh, phase two and phase one both use the CPU. Correct. Yeah. There's a whole detailed SM SDC presentation if you want to see it. The time does not permit today. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Oh, oh one more question. I'm sorry. Same, not, same page. Yes, Mike. So file system permissions, security, how's that handled in that same path? Because NTFS DAX doesn't have the full file system permissions of regular NTFS, oh, right? Oh, yes, it does. Oh, it does? Oh, have. yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah, Thanks. as Neil said, it, it, we flow through the file system perfectly normally when we open the file, right? When we create the handle that allows you to access the file, all the authentication check, all the access check, all the file layout, everything about it is figured out. And then you map the file to place it into memory. In the case here, you basically <laughs> register it. The, the, the analog for remote uh, access is to memory register it instead of map it, right? And that memory registration is then returned to the client. So all his permissions were checked, all the file setup was done, all the RDMA resources were allocated. It's like, here's your handle, party on. It's, it's, a, it's a strict, strict, strict checking. The difference is that in traditional SMB and a lot of file protocols, it's kind of a per IO transaction, right? You'll say, can I do a read, you know, please do a read, and you register some memory, and the data gets provided, and then you tear down the registration, right? It's per I.O. This push mode is a durable registration. You set it up, you say, I want to be able to push to you through your hardware, and you're not going to know I'm doing it. And so it sets up that registration and returns the handle. So the durability does change the access model a little bit, but all the same access checks were performed before it was granted. All right, thank you.